Good morning again. So good to hear you guys worshiping the Lord together with the band. Don't they do a great job? Can we give them a round of applause? Two sounds I love to hear in church. Full church worshiping, and then I love, I love the sound when we turn the pages in our Bible, and it kind of sounds like it's raining. I love that when the church is full and we're all turning our pages together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Can we do that? Father, we thank you for this sweet time of worship that you have provided for us today, the opportunity to have it. Lord, we began this morning with one of my favorite hymns. I love that line, Lord. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. What a powerful, powerful hymn you gave your servant way back in the 1800s. As he penned those words, I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in, glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves me from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Come, come to the fountain so rich and sweet. Cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Indeed, Lord, glory to your name. Thank you for the great gift of salvation and every other blessing you have bestowed upon us. We give you the honor and the glory. We give you the time that is to come as we approach your word, Father. May you do your work. May you have your way with us. May you speak to our hearts through your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever wanted to, to just get the benefit right away from something? To get the benefit prematurely, if you will? Uh, some of y'all know that, that I do real estate. I, have a, I, I do real estate on the side, um, kind of as a side hustle with Abby. Abby's been a real estate agent for a really long time, and I've always loved real estate. And so got my license some years ago. And a while back, I was helping this young couple buy their first house. It's a great thing as a real estate agent to get to walk somebody through that process for the very first time. And uh, this sweet young couple, they just got married. They were really trying to do things right. And so I, I told them to go get pre-approved for a loan because that's really what you need to do if you want to buy something when you're that age especially. And so they did. They went and got their pre-approval letter and they sent it to me. And uh, then they sent me a list of all the houses they wanted to go see. And I called them and I, I said, there's only one problem with your list of houses. They're all way more expensive than what the bank says they're going to give you to buy a house. And, and the young lady, we were on speakerphone together, and the young lady said, but, but I want to live in the kind of house my parents live in. And, and I said, I get it, I understand. Um, I, I would want to live in the kind of house your parents live in too. But ask your parents what the first house they lived in was like. You're not buying your last house. You're buying your first house. See, they, like all of us, I'm not, there's no judgment here, right? Like all of us, they wanted to get to the benefit. And, and I tell you this story because I want you to know as we're walking through the message today, we're going to get to the benefit, but it's going to be at the end. We've got to get through all the other stuff before we get to the benefit. And the benefit is good, and the benefit is great, and the benefit is full of grace. But we've got to walk through all the other stuff first. So hang with me today as we're doing that. The benefit is coming. It's just a little ways down the road. Amen? Depravity is the topic today, or our subject today, as we continue this series on collision. Depravity, the collision between righteousness and unrighteousness. Depravity is defined by one dictionary as a, 
a corrupt act or practice. Another describes it this way. It says it's a a very evil quality or a very evil way of behaving. No matter how you define it, I suspect there's not a person in this room, not a person who can hear my voice, who hasn't encountered some level of depravity in your life. And I suspect there's not a person in this room who is not capable of identifying it and knowing it when they see it. You see, depravity is easy to spot, isn't it? It's easy to spot for a couple of reasons. It's easy to spot because depravity sticks out like a sore thumb. It's hard to to hide true depravity. Depravity is easy to spot because, well, if we're being honest, it's everywhere we look. Amen? You don't have to look hard and you don't have to look far to find depravity. Depravity is, is easy to spot in our world if we're just being honest, church, because we are all personally and intimately acquainted with it. We know what it is and we know what it looks like and and we know what it's like because on some level or another, at some time or another, we have all battled depravity inside of ourself. The psalmist lamented, and I share his words in Psalms 51.5, he says, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Pointing to the depravity that affects us all. The depravity of humanity goes all the way back to the garden. This isn't a new problem. This isn't just our problem. This isn't just our culture's problem. It goes all the way back to the garden and this idea of original sin that came through Adam and Eve and their rebellion against God. That's what got the entire thing going. And if you, if you look at Genesis 6, and you don't have to turn there in your Bible, we're not camping here, but if you go to Genesis 6, just a couple of chapters later, I mean, we're not talking Exodus 6 or Leviticus 6 or Isaiah 6, we're talking Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, verse 5, it says this, When the Lord saw that human wickedness, depravity, was widespread on the earth, and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was deeply grieved. See, this isn't a new problem. It's not just our problem. It's not just a cultural problem. This is a humanity problem. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8-10, through 10, It puts it like this, if we say we have no sin, if we say we're not affected by depravity, if if we say this collision isn't happening inside of us, he says we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. He says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This collision between righteousness and unrighteousness happens inside of all of us. He says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him and his word out to be a liar, and his word is not in us, he says. Right there we see this collision that we're talking about today, a collision between righteousness and unrighteousness. This issue of depravity that not only surrounds us, but invades us and lives inside of us. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. But praise God, God is faithful to provide for us a path, a way to be cleansed from unrighteousness. But here's what you have to understand about this path in this way. It's it's not a path that you can discover or invent on your own. You You can't win this battle by yourself with unrighteousness and depravity. Perhaps one of the most famous verses of all is Romans 3.23. It's a verse that's quoted all the time. How many of you have heard Romans 3.23? How many of you could quote Romans 3.23 right now? Most of you, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. It's a well-known verse. It's a well-known fact that Paul exclaims there in verse 23. We're all sinners. That's easy to understand. 
But did you know that's found inside the context of a much larger issue that Paul is addressing? If you look at verses 21 through 26, just for some more context, Paul says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's that verse. Verse 24, they are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as the mercy seat by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented Him to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Two key things there, two key things in this text. Number one, Jesus is the righteousness of God. You need to understand that and know that. We're going to come back to it at the end today. And number two, God presented him, Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness. We'll come back to those two ideas as we close. But our main text comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. We're going to focus almost exclusively today on verse 21. As you're turning there in your Bibles, verse 21, let me tell you a little bit about it. Verse 21 in the Greek is 15 words. It's 15 words that make up one of the most powerful, most pointed, most purposeful statements in all of Scripture. 15 words that bring encouragement, 15 words that bring hope, 15 words that bring joy, 15 words that bring peace and love and grace and so much more. 15 words that articulate the entirety of the gospel of grace. 15 words that we would do well to camp on today and learn from today. But let's start in verse 16 for the context. It says, from now, verse 16, from now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. That's good news. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled, to God. Now, here comes verse 21. He says this, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Because of these 15 words here in verse 21, I can confidently proclaim to you today the big idea for today, which is this, Who I was is not who I am. How many of you can say with confidence, who you were is not who you are? Praise God. I want you to see four powerful points here in verse 21 specifically. First, I I, I want you to see that who I was is not who I am today because I have a great benefactor in God. God is the benefactor. I suspect we all know what a benefactor is. In other words, a benefactor is somebody who maybe you could say is a supporter or a contributor or a donor or a sponsor. In essence, the root of what a benefactor is, a benefactor is somebody who gives you something that they didn't have to give you. They give you something to help you. They give you something to promote you or to promote a cause or to help an effort that maybe you're leading or a part of. There's someone who gives something to someone to benefit something or someone else other than themselves. 
I don't know if you've read about it recently in the news, there was a very kind and generous benefactor who recently donated $1 billion, not to our church, unfortunately, (laughs) but $1 billion to a medical school in New York. Anybody read about that? See it on the news? As a result, all the medical students that attend that medical school from now, they say, for forever, are going to be able to attend the school tuition-free so more doctors and nurses and medical students can be created. It's a great thing. This person was a former professor at the school. First question I had is, how does a former professor make a billion dollars? I should have been a professor, apparently. But very kind of her to do that. But as impressive as that is, it's really chump change when it comes to benefactors. You ever heard of a guy by the name of Elon Musk? So far to date, he's still a young guy, so far to date he has donated some 7.6 billion, with a B, dollars of his wealth to various causes and institutions that he has chosen to be a benefactor for. Maybe you've heard of a guy, he's been gone for a while now, but the name Andrew Carnegie might ring a bell with you. He was a great benefactor of the arts. Music halls, libraries, things of that nature mostly. He did other things too. But he was a benefactor of some $9.5 billion to various causes that he cared about in his lifetime. And then there's a Chinese guy, and I'm probably going to butcher his name. I'm, I'm weak on my Chinese these days. I don't mean to butcher his name. I think you say his name, Li Kaxing. He's touted as being the greatest benefactor of all time. He's currently 95 years old, has a fascinating story. I read a little bit of it this week. As a young child, he and his family were displaced because of a war. They became refugees. He was born into poverty. At the age of 15, his dad died unexpectedly, and Lee had to drop out of school to support the family. He went to work at the age of 15, to support his family, to help support his mom. He worked in a factory, 16 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Never missed a day. At the age of 22, he decided to take a chance through some savings and some help and a lot of hard work and some relationships he had made along the way. At the age of 22, he decided to start a very small company to manufacture stuff out of this new stuff called plastic. You ever heard of it? Plastic? It was pretty new at the time. Lee saw a future there, and the rest is history. To date, Lee Ka-shing has donated over $10.7 billion, primarily to health and education purposes and causes and initiatives around the world. I added it up. The top three benefactors of modern history, if you will at least, have donated some $27.8 billion to things. The truth of the matter is, you could add up all the benefactors. You could put them all together, sum all of what they've given together, and what I'm about to tell you would still be true. All of those benefactors, wealth combined, and all of their generosity combined, could not even compare to the kind of benefactor God is. It's not even close. Our text begins with these two words, he made. He made. The only reason any of us have a path out of unrighteousness into the righteousness of God is because God made the path. He made it. He made that way. He made it possible. He made it a reality. He made it. You didn't make it. I didn't make it. This church didn't make it. No one else made it because no one else can make it. He made it. Romans 5, 10, and 11 says, For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received This reconciliation, the greatest gift you will ever receive in your life 
is the gift of righteousness and reconciliation. And God is the only one who can make that path. He's the only one who can make it possible. He made. That gift can only come from one benefactor. Li Ka Xing, no matter how generous and good his heart is, cannot make that path for you. Elon Musk, Andrew Carnegie, your pastor, your priest, your pope, whoever it is, they cannot make that path for you. They are not that kind of benefactor. He made it. Jesus went to the cross because that was God's plan to reconcile sinners like myself and yourself to himself. God sent his son to die on the cross so you and I could live. He made it. I love the way John MacArthur put it when he said it like this. He said, Jesus, therefore, did not go to the cross because fickle people turned on him, though they did. He did not go to the cross because demon-deceived false religious leaders plotted his death, though they did. He did not go to the cross because Judas betrayed him, though he did. He did not die because an angry, unruly mob intimidated a Roman governor into sentencing him to crucifixion, though they did. Jesus went to the cross as the outworking of God's plan to reconcile sinners to himself. He went to the cross because God was making a way. He went to the cross because we have a great benefactor in our Father. It was God's plan to have all his righteousness and his sinless Son collide with unrighteousness so we might have a path, so we might have a way made by him back to him. You see, who I was is not who I am, not because of who I am, but because of who he is and what he's done. Because he made the way. This verse has much more than just a great benefactor, though. We also see in this text, with great clarity, the blameless substitute. The blameless substitute. The words blameless and substitute have been chosen here with a deep degree of intentionality because they describe exactly what we must describe when we talk of Jesus. You see, in order for someone to be God's substitute, they have to be blameless. They have to be totally sinless. And Jesus is the only one to fit that bill. Verse 21 reads like this, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin. Think about that. He made that. Your great benefactor and mine. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin. Jesus knew no sin, but he bore the brunt of all sin. How is the righteousness of God colliding with the unrighteousness of the world and winning? Well, the answer is Jesus. We know from Scripture that Jesus was the sinless Lamb of God. We don't have time today to go through a bunch of verses, but I want to give you this one from 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. There are many scriptures that talk about the sinless nature of Jesus. I love this one. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you because our benefactor made a way. But we also see Jesus on multiple occasions challenging those who are opposing his ministry. And Jesus on multiple occasions just says, can you identify some sin in my life? Could you point out, could you bring an accusation against me? And you know what? They were never able to, not even once. Not even one time were they able to nail him with anything. You talk about a guy living in a glass house, you talk about a guy everybody was watching, and not one time nobody could put anything on him that would stick. This happened several times in the Scriptures. Again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you one, John eight forty six, Where Jesus, he, he says, 
Who among you can convict me of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? In other words, if you think I'm lying, tell me what I'm lying about. If you think I've sinned, name it. Call it out. Put it out there on the table. Let's talk about it. And no one could do it. Even at the very end of his ministry, near the very end of his life, just before his crucifixion, there was no one who could find any guilt or sin in Jesus. Three times Pilate would pronounce his innocence. Three times Pilate would say, I can't find anything wrong with this guy. I can't find any sin in him. I can't find any guilt in him. Luke 23, 4 says, Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. He's innocent. You can also look at verse 14 and verse 22 of Luke 23. And Pilate again, two more times, pronounces his innocence before all the people. In 1 John 3, it says as clearly as it can be said, Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins. And guess what? It says, and there is no sin in him. God made the one who knew no sin to be sin. Jesus was the blameless substitute who took your place and mine. That's the substitute part. He took our place, your place and mine, So anyone who is saved by the blood of the sinless Lamb of God can confidently say, who I was is not who I am. In these next two words, we see our third point, which is this, the beneficiaries. And you're going to like this one, because this is for most of us. The beneficiaries. I, I would love to say this is for all of us. I would love to say this part of the text is for everyone I would love to be able to say this is talking about everybody even in this room. But I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to give you a a false sense of security. I want you to see this for what it is because it's important that you do. The beneficiaries of the benefactor and the blameless substitute are those who have believed. They are those who have repented. They are those who have confessed. They are those who have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. That's why I can't say it's for everybody, because everybody probably hadn't done that. It's important you know who it's for. Those who reject His grace, those who ignore His call to repentance, those who forsake their great confession of His name, those who walk away, run away, stay away, or just fade away from the God who is constantly pursuing them with nothing other than love, grace, and mercy, will not be beneficiaries of the forgiveness and the righteousness that God offers. Paul is clear on it. Look at verse 21 again with me. It says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. I know what some of y'all are saying there. You're saying, well, Pete, I can read. That looks like it's for all of us. Sure does, doesn't it? For us. I can see how you would read that and go, it is. But this is why I'm always telling you, you want to read Scripture in context. I want you to back up with me here, and I want you to see who the us is. Paul Paul is not, he's being very clear in who the us is, but you have to see it in the context of the entire passage. The us does not refer to all of us. There's a lot of us's in here, but this isn't for all of us's, okay? I'm just going to say it like that, if I can confuse you a little more. If you look back at just the previous three verses, and we could go back even further, but for the sake of time, this will make our point. Just the previous three verses, we will see very clearly who the us is clearly pointing to here in this text, who Paul had in mind when he said it's for us, the beneficiaries, who they are. They are those who no longer walk in their depravity or unrighteousness because they have taken God up on his path to become his righteousness. Back up to verse 18, Paul says, Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is clearly pointing to the church. The us here is clearly pointing to those who have believed, those who have confessed, those who have received God's grace and mercy, those who have called on Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those who have been washed in the blood. He says he has reconciled us. You, he, that's how you get reconciled, right? That's how you become an us in this context. Us to himself through Christ, and then he gives us 
the ministry of reconciliation. You cannot have the ministry of reconciliation if you have never been reconciled. The us is those who have been reconciled, those who are the righteousness of God. Now look at verse 19. He says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Paul gets even clearer here. He says he's reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Again, you see the word us? To us. So God is reconciling the world to himself. He's chasing after them, running after them, pursuing them, providing a way for them, hoping they take the path to him that they too could become the righteousness of God. He is reconciling the world to himself, attempting to do that. But those who have been given the message of reconciliation to share are the church. They are those who have been reconciled. Again, Paul shows you who these two groups are. Now look at verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through who? Through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Paul's not saying us, the Apostle Paul, and my little band of believers that are running around telling the world about Jesus. He's saying us. All of us is who have been reconciled to God, all of us who have believed, all of us who have confessed, all of us who have repented, all of us who have taken this path that that God made for us, all of us have been given this message and God is making his appeal through us, his church. God's not making his appeal through the unrighteous people of the world. He's making his appeal through the church, through those who are saved, through those who have believed, through those who have been washed. So when he says in verse 21, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, he's building on all of that and much more. He's saying we are, the church is the beneficiaries of the benefactor and the blameless substitute. The Gospel of John says it like this in chapter 1, verse 11. It says, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God and to believe in his name, who were born not of a natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. You see, to be the beneficiary of the blameless substitute and the benefactor, you have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to repent. You have to be forgiven. You have to be saved. And that's what happened to me some 30 years ago. That's why I can confidently say today, who I was is not who I am. It has nothing to do with me or who I am at all. It has everything to do with him, who my benefactor is, who the blameless substitute who took my place is. I'm just the beneficiary of it. And then that leads me to point number four. And I told you we were going to get here. This is the benefit. If the text contains a benefactor, if the text has, and it clearly does, a blameless substitute, if the text clearly points to some beneficiaries, then it stands to reason there's some kind of benefit. Amen? Here in the last part of the verse, in verse 21, that benefit comes into play. It exposes itself. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him, here's the benefit, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me say that just one more time so it can settle on you. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's no greater benefit in all the world than that right there. That in Christ, we become the righteousness of God. That's an absolutely astounding statement. Let that sink in for a minute, church. You, me, us, the righteousness of God. You, with all your faults and failures and flaws, the righteousness of God. You, with all your sin and shame and sorrow, 
the righteousness of God. You, with all your guilt and grief, the righteousness of God. You, the one where this battle of righteousness and unrighteousness, this battle with depravity has raged inside of you, you can become the righteousness of God. You can be set free and cleansed from all unrighteousness and become the very righteousness of God. Of God, not because of you who you are, but because of who He is, because you have a benefactor and a blameless substitute who took your place and offers to make you a beneficiary so you get the benefit of becoming the righteousness of God. You can say, Who I was is not who I am. The Apostle Paul shares part of his testimony in Philippians chapter 3, and I always love this part of Philippians. I love all of Philippians, to be honest, but this always hits me. It resonates with me. Every time I I read this passage, I I just think, man, that's a guy who figured it out. He says this, starting in verse 7, he says, But everything that was a gain to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also considered everything to be a loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of Him, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them as dung. The word actually means poop. Poo. So that I may gain Christ, he says, and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. You see, Paul was a guy who had battled that depravity inside of him, just like you and me. He was a guy, that that war had raged inside of him, unrighteousness and righteousness. And for most of his life, he tried to achieve righteousness through the law. And then he had an encounter with Jesus. The benefactor sent the substitute to talk to him personally on that road to Damascus. And he became a beneficiary of the grace of God. He received that benefit and he never forgot it. It's why he said, not having a righteousness of my own, he knew where it came from. And not from the law, he says, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. Oh, church, when you discover the great benefit of righteousness, you'll be glad you did. Paul says, everything that was a plus to me, everything that was a gain, everything that was a positive, I now consider it nothing. I consider it loss, less than nothing, compared to knowing Jesus. He says, compared to having my unrighteousness erased and replaced with the righteousness of God, there is no comparison. Everything else is just poo. Paul says, who I was is not who I am. Earlier we started with Romans 3, 21 through 26, and we said of those verses that Jesus is the righteousness of God and that God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness. I want to close where we began. If you want to be a beneficiary of the righteousness that the benefactor and the blameless substitute offer you, You must repent and call on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. You want to know why there's no other name? You want to know why there's no other way? Because only the benefactor can make the way. And only Jesus can be the blameless substitute. There's no other way. There's no other name by which you must be saved. So you must repent. You must believe. You must confess if you want to be able to say who I was is not who I am. Then, only once you repent and believe and confess will you know the benefit of becoming the very righteousness of God. And that can happen in your life this very day, this very hour 
before this next prayer is even over. What an incredible benefactor we have. And what an amazing substitute Jesus was. Let us pray. If that's you this morning and you have never given your life to the Lord, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that, not by coming forward, not by walking an aisle, not by standing or raising a hand, but just by you doing business with God right there where you're at. I'm going to ask you to pray, to repent, believe, and confess, and to be saved. If that's you, just say this. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. I know that I've gone astray. So today, by faith, I ask that you would change me. Lord, by faith, I ask that you would make me new. That you would cleanse me from the inside out. Lord, by faith, I ask that you would forgive me. I thank you for your grace and your goodness, for your love and for your mercy. For making a way for me. Father, as we close this hour, we are in awe of who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you for the great work of the cross, the great sacrifice and the great efforts you went to to pursue us, to make a way for us, to get back to you. Lord, we are thankful that this collision with depravity has been won through the gospel and through Jesus, that we might become the very righteousness of God. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. And Lord, for those who just prayed a moment ago, who were so wondrously saved from their sin, Jesus so sweetly now abides within. Here on this very day, at the foot of the cross, Lord, you took them in. Glory. To your name. Father, we rejoice in the work that was done here in the lives of those who called on you. Father, we pray you would continue to use us to make your appeal to a world who desperately needs to hear the good news of the gospel as they sink lower and lower into the depravity that rages within and around us all. May you use us for that purpose this week. In Jesus' name, amen.